This is an optional help video for the Physics 1101-1120 friction experiment. In this video, I'm going to show you how to begin calculating the uncertainty for your coefficient of kinetic friction. Now, you're going to have to show your lab instructor how you calculated this using free body diagrams. So hopefully I'm not giving away too much of the game here by showing you what your final expression should look like for the coefficient of kinetic friction if you've done your calculations correctly. So this is our initial expression, and looking at this you may say to yourself, gee, where do I even start? Because there's five different variables here. There's the mass of the hanger, the mass of the box, gravity, the acceleration of the system, and also the angle of the track. So we've got a lot of different things that have uncertainties associated with them, and a pretty complicated expression, where do we begin? Well, I'm going to begin by actually rewriting this in a new form. So I'm going to write this as mu, is equal to capital A minus capital B over capital C. So A is equal to all of this, B is equal to all of this, and this is C. So that simplified it a little bit, and I'm going to make one more simplification. I'm going to rewrite this again as D over C. So capital D equals capital A minus capital B. The reason why I'm doing this is that I can now apply the multiplication division rule for uncertainty propagation to just this little bit here. So I can write out the uncertainty of my kinetic coefficient of friction is, and I'm just going to apply the multiplication division rule to this. So it'll be d over c, square root, and then the fractional uncertainty of d, squared, plus the fractional uncertainty of c, squared. So this isn't the final expression, obviously, because we know that a, b, c, and d are all fairly complicated things. So our next step is that we're going to take a more complicated expression, find the uncertainty of it, and then nest it inside of these simplified expressions. So I'm going to start by doing this for C, which is all of this stuff here. So C is equal to mass of the box times G cosine theta. And we can, again, just apply the multiplication division rule to this. So I can write out the uncertainty of this directly, which is going to be mb g cos theta square root and then fractional uncertainty of mb squared fractional uncertainty of g squared and the uncertainty of cosine theta will be sine theta times the uncertainty of theta so it'll be sine theta delta theta divided by cosine theta all squared so now I've got the uncertainty of C and C, and I'm going to nest those two things inside this expression here. So let me write that out. That gives me D over, and I'll write in C now, square root, fractional uncertainty of D squared, plus, and now I nest in my solution. So I'll have MBG cosine theta square root, fractional uncertainty m squared, fractional uncertainty of g squared, and then sine theta, delta theta, divided by cosine theta, all squared. All of that's over top of m, b, g, cos theta, all squared. And now we can actually simplify things a little bit, because this cancels out with this stuff on the bottom, and we'll have the square of a square root. So let me rewrite this again, just to make it look a little bit neater. So I end up with d over mbg cos theta square root delta d over d squared plus, and now again I'm going to take the square of a square root, and that'll give me fractional uncertainty of mb squared, fractional uncertainty of g squared, and then sine theta delta theta divided by cosine theta squared, and that's all inside the square root. So that's one bit done. So now I'm going to move on to the next part, which will consist of finding the uncertainty of a minus b, which we're then going to nest inside this part of the expression. So I'm going to go to a new sheet of paper, just because obviously this is getting a little bit messy. So here's where we left off, and we've got d is equal to a minus b, and I now want to find the uncertainty of a minus b so I can nest it into my expression. So d is equal to a minus b, and to get the uncertainty of this, all we need to apply is the addition-subtraction rule for uncertainty propagation. So the uncertainty of d is just going to be square root uncertainty of a squared plus uncertainty of b squared. 
So now we'll take these two things, nest them back inside the expression. So the uncertainty of the coefficient of conductive friction becomes a minus b over mb g cos theta square root. Pardon me, I just made an error there. Um, now we put in our uncertainty here, square root uncertainty of a squared plus uncertainty of b squared over a minus b, so that's what d was, all of that squared, and then the rest of the terms in here. So fractional uncertainty of mb squared, fractional uncertainty of g squared, and the uncertainty of cosine theta over cosine theta, all squared. So now we can go on to the next hard bit, which is we need to find the uncertainties of a and b. And remember, they were these expressions here. Now I'm going to do the uncertainty of a with you, and I'm going to leave the uncertainty of b for you to finish up. So again, I'm going to go to a new piece of paper just so I don't run out of space. So again, here's where we left off. And so our next task is we want to find the uncertainty of a, which was this stuff here. So a is equal to mh g minus a. And I can't immediately apply the multiplication division rule to this because there's also addition subtraction. So this is actually a mix of two rules. So anytime you see that where you've got a mix of more than one rule, it's a good idea to do that substitution trick again to simplify things. So I'm going to rewrite this as mh times f. So I'm defining a new variable f which is equal to g minus a. And this I can immediately apply one uncertainty propagation rule to. So the multiplication division rule. So the uncertainty of a is going to be mh f times square root fractional uncertainty of mh squared plus the fractional uncertainty of f squared. But before I substitute this back in here, I'm going to deal with this f. So f is equal to g minus a, and this is just going to be the addition subtraction rule. So I'll apply that to get its uncertainty. So uncertainty of f is going to be square root uncertainty of g squared plus uncertainty of a squared. And now I'm going to take these and substitute them into here to get my complete expression for the uncertainty of a. So uncertainty of a is going to be mh g minus a, open the square root, fractional uncertainty of mh, and then I substitute these guys into the second term. So it'll be square root uncertainty of g squared plus uncertainty of a squared over g minus a, which is what f was, all of that squared. So this down here is our uncertainty for a, which then gets nested into the original expression here. And obviously things are about to get pretty messy if I actually do that, so I'm not going to do it explicitly for you. But I will say that now that you've got a, you substitute it in here, and then you would do something similar to get b substituted in here, put in the original expressions for a and b everywhere else, and then you're done with your uncertainty expression for the kinetic friction coefficient. Now when you get done calculating your uncertainty, it's going to look something like this. It's a huge expression. You may be thinking to yourself, well how am I supposed to type this into Excel without making a mistake somewhere? Well what's a good idea anytime you've got a very large expression is that you should type a little piece of it into one cell and a little piece of it into another cell and then bring them together in a third cell. In other words, you'd split it up into subcalculations. Let me show you what I mean. So here's a spreadsheet that contains data and formulas. So I'm going to scroll down to the place where they've calculated their coefficient of kinetic friction. So that's here, these two cells. Now if I scroll down just a little more, you see these subcalculations underneath. So these subcalculations are for angle 2, and over to the left there's some subcalculations for angle 1. So I'm going to concentrate on angle 2 just because it's a little easier to see. Now as I said, if you've got a fairly complicated expression, it's a good idea to break it down into little pieces and then bring them all together somewhere else. So this will demonstrate how that's done. So you'll recall that the coefficient of friction was a fairly complicated expression all by itself. But if I click into this cell so that you can see the formula, you see that what they have typed here is actually very simple. It's just one value minus another divided by a third. So what are those values? Well, they've actually calculated them down below. So they're in the subcalculations. Now you'll recall that when we were calculating the uncertainty on the coefficient of friction, that we first started by simplifying things down. We had a complicated expression, we just called it a. 
we had another one, we called it B. We had a third one, we called it C. That's essentially the formula that they've got typed here, A minus B divided by C, where A, B, and C have been calculated down below. Now A, B, and C were themselves fairly complicated, so I'm going to show you how they calculated this one here. So if I click into this, you see that it looks like a much simpler form than you'd expect. So according to the label, here is the mass of the box times the acceleration plus g sine theta. And yet what we have here in the formula is just two values multiplied by each other. The first one, A42, is the mass of the box. So what's this K51? Well, that's calculated right above this cell, and according to its label, it is the acceleration plus g sine theta. So they calculated this term that they were going to need later in the cell right above it. So let's go and have a look at that one as well. So if I click into this one, again you see that the cell contains a formula that looks a little simpler than you might expect. According to the label, this is the acceleration times g sine theta, but they've calculated g sine theta in a separate cell, so that's again right above it. If I go and look at that, again I find that they actually calculated the sine theta in a separate cell. So let me show you what they did chronologically now. First, they calculated sine theta, then they calculated g times sine theta here, then they calculated the acceleration plus g sine theta, and finally they calculated the mass of the box times the acceleration plus g sine theta. So they just worked their way along building up a complicated expression bit by bit. And then this is what got used here for their coefficient of friction. And they've done the same thing for all three of these terms, for a, b, and c. The reason why you would do something like this rather than typing the whole expression in here as one formula is that it makes it a lot easier to troubleshoot. If you build up your expression bit by bit like this, then you can check each of these boxes individually, and it makes it a lot easier to find little errors. Now I'll just point out that they've done the same thing here for their coefficient of friction's uncertainty. Remember that that was an enormous calculation, but they've built it up step by step here in order to make something that's a little simpler and easier to deal with. If you take this expression here, the simplified coefficient of friction, and calculate the uncertainty just on this, then you get something that looks like this. So this is a pretty manageable looking expression, and if we double click here to see what they have typed in for their formula for the coefficient of friction's uncertainty, you see that this is what they typed in, where each of these little terms was calculated down below in the subcalculations. So again, let me show you how they built one of these up. They started by calculating the fractional uncertainty of sine theta, they then used that to calculate the uncertainty of g times sine theta, which in turn got used to calculate the uncertainty of the acceleration plus g sine theta, and then that again in turn was used to calculate the uncertainty of the mass of the box times the acceleration plus g sine theta. And then this expression gets used above to calculate the uncertainty of the coefficient of friction. So they built up an enormous calculation in a fairly simple way just by going at it piece by piece. So the next thing you're going to want to do with your uncertainty expression is you're going to want to do a precision analysis on this. In other words, you want to figure out what affected your precision the most, which of the five measurements. And with a really complicated uncertainty expression like this, it's a more subtle analysis than just looking at the fractional uncertainties. So the first thing you'd want to do with this is you'd want to simplify things down so that you can isolate individual uncertainties and the term that accompanies them. So earlier in the video I showed you how you could square a square root and then do some cancellations in order to simplify this part down. There's a couple of places in this expression where I've already done that, here and here for example, but there's other places where I could, where I could square a square root and then make some cancellations and then later square another square root and make some more cancellations. So that's what you would do here is you'd get this as simplified as possible and once you have done that, you'd end up with something that looks like this, where you'd have a whole bunch of individual terms. I realize you can't see these in the video, but individual terms all divided by one denominator plus these extra terms over here that we had before. So it does simplify down quite a bit, but you're not done at this stage. Then you want to group terms according to the uncertainty that accompanies them. In other words, this term here has the uncertainty of acceleration. This one does too. You'd have to group those two terms. Likewise, the uncertainty of gravity appears here, and here, and also over here, so you'd need to group all of those terms as well. Once you've done this, you'll wind up with something that looks like this expression here, where I've got the uncertainty of the hanging mass here, squared, times just one cofactor, so a bunch of terms that have been grouped here, and then the uncertainty of gravity, squared, 
times again a bunch of terms that have been grouped out of this expression here. So again, just as an example, the uncertainty of gravity appears here, and there's the term for it. It also appeared here, and there's the term for that. And they were divided by that common denominator here. And then this lone term over here also appears. So I've got just one cofactor times the uncertainty of gravity. And likewise for all the other terms. So there were five uncertainties in this expression, so I've got five terms down here. So to do your precision analysis, what you'd need to do would be to calculate each of these five terms that accompany the five uncertainties and see which one is biggest. So I'd recommend you do that in your spreadsheet. And if, for example, this term was the one that was largest, then that uncertainty tells you what measurement affected your precision the most. So this would be the mass of the box. If this was the largest term, then in your report you'd say the mass of the box affected my precision the most. So again, to do your precision analysis, take your big expression for the uncertainty and simplify it down as much as possible, and then group terms according to their uncertainties, and you'll have five of them for five different uncertainties, and then you calculate each of these cofactors and see which one is biggest.